Alright guys, so we are in chapter 14 about enlightenment and revolution and we are doing section 1 of this chapter about the age of reason and today we will continue our lesson in lesson 3 of section 1 about Europe's rulers and the enlightenment and that is in pages 386 to 387. That's King Louis XIV, by the way, just in case you're curious to know who is this good-looking guy with uh, a fancy hair and a very cool socks, pair of socks. Have your textbooks ready or go to our Loda USD website and log in to Clever and from Clever to Cengage Learning, which is our history book, and log in with your student account and password. From the left side, it's Unit 5 and Chapter 14, Section 1, Lesson 3 pages 386 to 387. This chapter's essential question is how did new ways of thinking about government and human rights led to revolution? And the objective of this lesson is to explain the effect of enlightenment ideas to some European rulers. So far in this section, we learned about the enlightenment idea itself, or ideas actually, and we also covered about the enlightenment thinkers. In this lesson, the previous lesson, we learned about John Locke, Baron de Montesquieu, René Rousseau, and those Enlightenment thinkers. Today, we'll continue our lesson on how Europe's rulers were influenced by Enlightenment thinking. This lesson has two parts. The first one is about the rise of the absolute monarch, and the second part is about the enlightened despots. Now to understand the rise of absolute monarchy, you have to know that during the Middle Ages, kings and queens are very powerful. But because of the rise of the nobility and the church, they were able to limit the power of the kings and the queens. So as the system broke down, uh, monarchs took more power for themselves. And by 1600, some ruled as absolute monarchs. The meaning of this is that they have unlimited authority and almost no legal limits. They claim to rule by divine right, meaning that their power came directly from God. Now, if people are really religious, of course, this is um, something that will somehow manipulate a lot of people because they, they truly worship God, they, they obey the commandments of God. Therefore, if a ruler says that I am appointed by God, so a lot of them, most of them, will not question this, uh, the validity of their rule. In other words, this is like uh, a worse version of your sibling telling you that your parents uh, told him or her that they are in charge of the house while your parents are gone. Now, if that's true, then it shouldn't be a problem. But if it's a lie, then that is a very big problem. There were so many people during this time, leaders during this time, who claimed to have divine right. But of all these uh, leaders, King Louis XIV of France is the most notable. Yes, the one with interesting uh, pair of stockings. So for most of his 72-year reign, Louis ignored all of France's traditional institutions. He, inc he excluded um, the nobles from uh, government and enforce his will through government officials. And at Versailles, uh, near Paris, Paris, uh, he built a massive palace to show off his power. He became known as the Sun King because he chose the sun as his symbol. Maybe that explains about his fancy hair as well. Indeed, all France is revolved around him, like the planets around the sun. Now let's take a look at the Palace of Versailles. Um, it was the main residence of the French kings from 1682 to 1789. The site was uh, originally a hunting lodge for Louis XIII, uh, but was transformed and expanded by Louis XIV. The size of it is about seven acres. Uh, the opulent palace came to represent absolute monarchy of free revolutionary France. So... That is the French Revolution. And you will get to know more about this when you learn about U.S. history. And uh, it is around the same uh, time frame or timeline. Today, Versailles is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, meaning it's protected. 
This oil painting shows Versailles as it appeared in 1668 before it was enlarged by Louis XIV. Uh, the palace magnificent garden were designed by André Lenotre, who transformed more than 15,000 acres of muddy swamp um, into magnificent landscapes that added to uh, the ornate design of the palace itself. So this is really a stunning um, view. Although the absolute monarch exists, uh, during this time, a growing middle class was pressing for a voice in the policies that affected them. So the middle class, uh, these are the merchant class, these are uh, the professionals, and these are you know the people in between the peasant class and the upper class, which is most likely the nobility, the monarch. In England, as you may recall, this trend led to the creation of Magna Carta, uh, where uh, the nobility forced uh, King John to sign uh, this agreement limiting the power of the king and a parliament made of, of nobles and elected uh, commoners as well during this time. So there's like a lot of development in England, but in a way in France, they are a little bit behind because of this absolute monarch that we are talking about. This is the picture of the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, uh, which still dazzles visitors today because of its uh, magnificent view. Uh, look at how um, King Louis displayed uh, the splendor of his kingdom. This is King Louis' uh, way of flexing, I guess. So that's how he showcased his wealth, his vast wealth during uh, this time. And it still impressed a lot of people today, of course. Of course, not every leader during this time were abusive, absolute monarchs. There are some individuals who applied enlightenment ideas, meaning giving more rights to individuals, but they did not surrender their absolute uh, power. Um, they applied certain ideas, and a good example, for example, is Frederick the Great, who ruled Prussia from 1740 to 1786. Frederick introduced religious tolerance, meaning other people can practice their religion, not necessarily the state religion. And he also um, enforced legal reforms. He banned torture and helped peasants to improve their farms. However, Frederick refused to change the social hierarchy of Prussia. It means that there is still discrimination uh, among you know, members of the society to those who belong to the upper, middle, and lower class. Another enlightened despot is Joseph II of Austria. So just like Frederick the Great, he introduced religious tolerance, freedom of the press, meaning generally uh, people can express what they have in mind. Of course, there are limitations and various law reforms. He firmly believed in social equality and he introduced basic education and abolished serfdom, which is very important. Serfdom is a little bit better than slavery and worse than peasantry. Now let's talk about the last one, Catherine the Great, uh, who ruled Russia from 1762 to 1796. Um, she favored enlightened ideas, but she struggled to introduce reforms. It's because of the strong, patriarchal, male-dominant uh, Russian culture. She considered freeing the serfs, but changed her mind when she realized she needed the support of the serf-owning nobles to keep herself in power. So these are the people who support her. Similarly, when Catherine called together elected representatives from all classes to suggest reforms, the meeting failed because of each group's self-interest. Uh, self well, obviously, in politics, there's no permanent friend or permanent enemy, only permanent interest, as they say. However, Catherine did succeed in expanding education, science, and the arts in Russia. So that's quite an accomplishment, actually, for a woman during this time in Russia. So that is really something very impressive. Okay, now let's go to the review and assess questions for number one reading check. How were absolute monarchs and enlightened despots similar and different? What are their similarities and differences? Well, of course, um, you will most likely be comparing King Louis and the other three, at least three leaders that I mentioned, Frederick, Joseph, and Catherine. 
Now for number two, make connections. In what ways did the enlightened despots reflect the ideas of the philosophies or philosophers? In what ways did they fail to reflect those ideas? And finally, number three, analyze cause and effect. What effect did enlightenment have on monarchs such as Frederick the Great, Joseph II, and Catherine the Great? What are the effects of enlightenment ideas to these leaders, to these enlightened despots as we were uh, talking about? Now go ahead, go to our Google Classroom, and of course fill up your last name, first name, class period, and date. And don't forget to put the definition of the key vocab, which is divine right. And of course, uh, put the title of the lesson and answer the review and assess questions that I just read in complete sentences, using your own word, and absolutely, of course, putting the correct answers to those questions. So that's the last lesson for Chapter 14, Section 1, The Age of Reason, European Rulers, and the Enlightenment.